Paul, if I don't, if you don't mind, if I can just have you somewhere where I can, for this. Sure, I can do that. You can keep directly where you want me to go. Um, just on this side of the circle. I can do that. Yeah. All last summer, we were complaining about these actors and they're working out. It's freezing. I came in here and I dropped it for that. You know what? Maybe Ida did what we couldn't by uh, hitting that system. Hey, you guys want me to bump it up a little bit? I have never done that here. <laughs> Usually it's body heat. That's what it is. All right, guys. Um, so, uh, all right, so. Um, all right, so like I said, this is our most intimate room that we've had. Um, so I love situations like this. Anytime I do public speaking, I actually prefer this because you just get this opportunity to get way more. So um, Paul and I have known each other for years. We've got the privilege of serving our community um, every Saturday on WWL. Um, but Paul, Paul's resume um, is part of mine. As you guys know, the building science expert, 30 plus years contractor. Um, I always say 30 plus years, but has it gone up? Because it's been a few years I've been saying that. I don't know. That would be more. So, and Paul, you do legal expert witness work. How, how long have you been doing that? 2000. So, that legal expert work uh, is on both sides of the uh, of a case, right? Either representing homeowners, representing the insurance companies, and your main role in that is to speak on what? Most of it is is uh, construction failures, and uh, it deals with, well, it depends on what side of the table you work in. You know, sometimes you do the forensic investigation, identifying what's a failure, why did it fail, and then sometimes in cases like what we have after Hurricane Ida, um, it will be that the, uh, the adjuster just missed it on the scope of one, or the unit cost for every item of things to get it approved was a mess, or there was fraud, or there was a breach of contract. Um, you know, that, that certainly does happen. Sometimes I'm, I'm representing the insurance company, and the homeowner is like way out in left field. I'll give you a good example, and it's one example for Rodale Friends' presentation. Uh, there's a house I'm, I'm working with right now on the attorney and the field adjuster, where it was in Laplace, it three inches of water in it. Well, by the time the flood adjuster gets there, the entire house is done. The ceilings, the ceiling insulation, the whole house is completely done down to the skeleton, to the framing. And the adjuster is saying, you had three inches of water, why did you remove the ceiling? She so, you know, well, my house flooded, I gutted it. Well, that's a little unfair, right? <laughs> so, you, yeah, if you've got three inches of water from the four feet nail, all the cabinets, all your flooring, all your interior doors, your door, Obviously, all it's have no fireplaces, tubs, toilets, yeah, but not the ceiling. So there are some things where folks will take advantage of this scenario and try to stretch the truth. So I'll, I'll represent the insurance companies on that stuff on those type of cases. So, so Paul, the goal tonight was so I know both you and I are in the middle of um, insurance claims um, on various projects. You're an investor yourself. Um, obviously, you do a ton um, as a as a as a consultant in the area, as a legal expert witness. Um, so there's a lot going on, obviously, post Ida. How many of you guys are actively going through insurance claims right now? We say, is there anyone not going through an insurance claim right now? <laughs> That's probably a better question. Okay, um, but hey, I'm even want to go. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm on the fence. Well, <laughs> look, and I have projects like that right now that I'm considering. Is it worth to fight it? Exactly. All right. The, the cost to fight it, the, and also the hill, the climb, and all that. So tonight, the goal tonight with Paul is for him to speak on two things: 
going through that process um, with the insurance claim and, and whether it's deciding if it's worth it, uh, whatever that process may look like. Um, and also breaking it down because, look, I was not investing during Katrina. I mean, um, and so there's a lot of new investors in the marketplace or areas that didn't get hit like Katrina got hit, but got hit, you know, this time. But, um, and then the second thing is it's just some, some general, hey, how to rebuild. Because you got places um, like LaFlosse that got hit multiple times, right, Rita, that got, that people like, hey, is there a better way for me to go back and build? Is there, you know, something? So without further ado, I'm going to let Paul go. Um, Paul, do you want to hold questions to the end, or do you want to allow questions throughout, or? Let me just kind of paint a picture of what the process should look like, and I'll use a couple examples of things that I've seen recently since the since And then I'll let you open up the questions and answer questions just related to the insurance claim. What are you hearing? What is your adjuster telling you? Where are you in the process? And then after that, part two was how do we rebuild? And there's a lot of flood party information out there on um, improvements we've made since Hurricane Katrina, everything floods that can help you with that. I'm really going to leave that open for questions because I don't know what you're faced with. I'd rather just ask me a question. Most likely do the radio show. Ask me the question, I'll tell you how it should be done. So, everybody cool with that format? So, let me give you the lay of the land of what this process should be. So if you've ever taken the time to read the insurance policy, which most folks don't, um, it, there's this requirement on the insurance holders side that you have to prove loss, right? So the proof of loss is very simple. You call up the insurance uh, uh, you know, company, you make a claim, and you go online, you make a claim, and you relate it to a certain event, in this case, hurricane. So a real simple phone call, they ask you some qualifying questions, you develop the information, they schedule a field adjuster. The field adjuster, most people think it's the decision maker, and that person really is not. The purpose of the field adjuster is to come to your property and document the condition of your property. They are not making the choices. They're not making decisions through this. They're offering an opinion of what the damage is. And a lot of times, you need to be your biggest advocate for your property. You know your property way better than an adjuster, and you need to tell them, hey, this wasn't there before the storm. This happened as a result of the storm. Uh, I, listen, I wasn't here, but my neighbor stayed next door, and my roof shingles were flapping in the wind. Well, we had a tornado come over there. Look, there's proof of it. My neighbor's house, to my neighbor's house. Those are all good information you can feed the field adjuster that they can document. They can take photographs and they can document it. That is their sole role, is to document that's there and offer an opinion and develop an estimate of what it's going to cost to put your house back. At that next step, your next step is actually that information from the field adjuster goes to the desk adjuster. That's the decision person's going to make decisions, right? That's the person you want to get to eventually. Uh, keep in mind, they, for this, this entire process, there are a lot of bites at the apple. There's not a one single thing. Most people think the field adjuster is going to come, I'm going to get a phone call, they're going to say your, your estimate's ready, we're going to mail you the estimate, we're going to mail you a check, and that's it. That is so untrue. There are lots of opportunities, lots of bites of the apple that you can go back and supplement your claim. In fact, I would encourage you to do that. Meaning if you found things after the? If you found things after the fact. Okay. Uh, or even just, you know, just discover new things, because there's going to be times when you could be discovering new damage. I can tell you that uh, at my house, my primary residence, there's new damage that's still cropping up, particularly with electronics and appliances, because they don't show up right away. Uh, and that's mostly from the power surges in and out, or strike of lightning, or something along those lines. Actually, I think I had both of mine, uh, because there was a whole section of the electrical panel that, that could get you know, affected by lightning strikes. But then we also have some, we've had some brownouts in and out. How many of you had your power restored after the event and turned off four or five pound sensor? Should be everybody in the throat pretty much, right? Um, and that's that's true whether no matter what you tell the company you have, it's just part of the that the grid's fragile when it first comes back on, and there's been a lot of repairs made in very short order, and now the uh, companies that uh, own that infrastructure will come in, they'll inspect every single repair to make sure it's done up to standard, and they may take some things apart and redo it because they have more time. So it's pretty common to have that power moving it out and have some damage show up after the fact. 
there's also some some items you can supplement because you're going to learn that even though the adjuster included that item in the scope of work, the cost to actually execute that improvement is much higher than what the insurance company allotted for that asset. That is not uncommon at all. Let me explain those dynamics. So the software the insurance companies use is called Xactimex, estimating software. Uh, I used it when I was doing adjusting uh, years after Katrina. And it, it, it's a really powerful program, but it's, um, and you probably heard this term before, junk in, you push junk out. You got the really good information in, you get good information out of it. So it's, it's, you're relying on the adjuster to understand the software. That's one component. The other component of it is exactly made for the unit cost is typically 40 to five to 60 days behind schedule. So our costs have been climbing and climbing and climbing. Some of it because of availability of materials, some of it because we are low on labor force and it's taken a lot longer to get jobs done. It's also cost a lot more money to get jobs, improvements made, repairs made. So exactly made is gonna lag a little bit. Like I said, 45, 60 days. So by the time you get your estimate from your, your insurance company and you hire and make an agreement with someone to make the improvements, there's gonna be a difference between what's gonna cost you to make, it, uh, make those assets as opposed to the insurance allocated for you. Well, go back and solve what you claim. In fact, I'm gonna encourage you, don't wait for your adjuster to come to your home and give you an estimate. Go find your professionals, whether subcontractors or general contractors, and give that estimate to your, your adjuster when he's at your house. Hey, I've already had somebody assess my home. I've already had an appliance person come assess these, uh, these appliances, or electricians already assess that. Stick with your licensed professionals, your, your licensed insured electricians, your air conditioning. You should, every one of the air conditioning should be checked right now. They should be checked. Because with the powers going in and out like that, those, those capacitors are very sensitive to that. The low voltage sides are very sensitive to that. Same thing with your plumber. You need to have a plumber come to if your house was struck by lightning. Uh, have them check out the water heaters, have them check out the grounding, uh, the, the gas pipe. So these are all things where you're going to hire and rely on your licensed professionals to come in and assess the main infrastructure of your home. Have them, you pay them for a service call, have them write out their professional opinion and what happened to that appliance and why they believe it happened and have it related to Hurricane Maya. You know, if it's not related, then that's not something you include on your insurance claim. I mean, this is the point you have to be honest, right? But if it is included, if it is physical damage, and that may not be included in the original uh, estimate from your insurance adjuster. And the insurance companies are used to this. This is not anything new for them. They actually don't expect their field adjusters to catch everything. I think it's unrealistic. And, uh, well, I know we're taking it, I'll say it anyway. The vast majority of the adjusters that I met during Katrina and Rita and events since then, even with Ida, they're new to this. They're not construction experts. They went and got the training, they got the class, they got put out, baptism of you know, heart, right? They get thrown out there, so you go do your job. So they're not experts in your field. You need to feed some of them some information from licensed professionals and let them take that information and bring it up to the, the desk adjuster. Right? And it's kind of hard for the desk adjuster to argue when you have a professional air condition, licensed professional saying, this air condition doesn't work because they got struck by light or because they had a power surge or uh, it had been flooded and it got twisted and turned over. Uh, so that's kind of hard to argue against. So the, the, the insurance company typically accept those bids and proposals for that. Get very specific, make sure it's got your name on it, make sure it has your address, the model number, the serial number, the equipment, uh, have, you know, have some causation. Uh, floodwaters came and lifted up or winds came and, and twisted air conditioning condenser and, and all the free on leak out or get struck by lightning, whatever the cause is, right? Give some description in their in their proposal and their assessment. Check on this, make sure I'm not missing anything. Did you need any water? Just let me know. Oh, I have some, thank you. Okay. Something else too is um, roofs. Roofs are, for, roofs are a big thing right now mm -hmm. because Everyone's roof really should be assessed at, at, at this point. If, if you were uh, anywhere uh, 
end up this happens so you really should be getting all your properties reduced to sex. I, I got a person that came in and called everyone that reduced the properties to me, including my primary, and they had a GoPro camera on their on their hat and they were recording video and audio as they were analyzing the roof. And they looked for roof uplift, they looked for cracked shingles, anything that would compromise the roof, the missing shingles, water leaks, why they were there at the water leaks, they patched it while they're there. And they offered a very detailed estimate at the end of what it would take to repair or, if necessary, replace your roof. And one thing that a lot of folks are, are experiencing is they're not getting enough money to replace the roof. And let me give you an example. Uh, and here is an example of, a, of a, an estimate I'm working on right now. So here is a, a picture of a page of an exactimate estimate for replacing the roof. Like it the breakdown all, of the cost and everything like it that. It has all the individual items to break down the unit cost and the quantities and things like that. So this is what most people are receiving right now. On the back, I wrote all the things that's missing mm -hmm. of what it takes to repair your roof. Can you take a picture of that? Um, sure. Okay. I'll be happy to share it with you. On the back, for this roof, which is an average, you know, 1,900, 2,000 square foot home, plus a double car garage and a, and a rear patio, these uh, uh, back here counts for about $3,000 that the insurance company didn't include. So can we go back and supplement that claim? Absolutely, get your roofer to write their, their estimate including all these things that get missed by the adjuster who is new to the job, who is being, you're doing the best they can, they're doing the best they can. I'm not trying to blame them, but keep in mind, you need to be your biggest advocate for your, for your properties. Knowledge is power. That's why we're here, to learn some, some information we can share. I'll, you can take a picture of this when we're done. I'll be happy to share it with you. Thank you. But some of the typical things that they miss, <coughs> and I see this often, it's not just for I know. Um, they miss uh, flashing around pipe jacks. That's the, as your plumbing pipe penetrates your roof with the vents, plumbing vents, they miss those jacks. Uh, valley flashing, sometimes they include it, sometimes they don't. The flashing around your fireplace fluid. If you got a fireplace and the fluid comes through, they miss that flashing quite often. The vents over water heaters and gas furnaces that penetrate your roof or the exhaust vent, they miss those often. Um, they miss additional charges for steep roofs. So when you have a steep roof, let me define this as a steep roof. So, so the angle of roof is, is based on a pitch, and it's based on a uh, number over 12. So a 7-12 pitch or a greater, 8-12, 9-12, 12-12, are all steep roofs. A roof that's single story versus two story costs more to do a two story house versus a single story house. A steep roof that costs more, and you, it's more on both ends, on the removal of the shingle as well as the replacement of the shingle. Courtney has a property um, near Barker's Corner. That is a steep roof. Is that a, I think it's a 12-12, It's huh? a 12-12, I mean, that, yeah. that thing is like, like every Scary single time problem. people climb it and I'm there, I'm just like, please don't fall. Yes. Please, like I, I truly fear it because, uh, and I also specifically went out there because I was concerned that the adjusters or they sent structural engineers that they were not gonna climb it because it's more intimidating yes. and therefore they weren't gonna actually look at it, right? That was one of my concerns was because it was, you know, I mean, all, all, all it has to take is one of them to be like, yeah, I don't feel like climbing that today, you know? And then what happens? And I had uh, a, the, similar, uh, the same guy go out and um, take a look at it, and he, he, he found so much damage that the uh, adjuster didn't even find, and the, the fear is that they actually didn't go to, well, the thought is they didn't go to all those places because it's such a high pitch, and it's a two-story house as well. More complex your claim, the greater the opportunity for that adjuster to overlook on this. Not that they do it on purpose, please don't, that's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying here is that it's just their level of time that they can spend in the house, and also their level of knowledge is probably lacking in some Because they have so many claims here to do, they can't spend two and a half days in the house. It's just, it's not feasible. So, uh, some other common things they miss for roof, um, dumpster trail, a dumpster or dump trail, you know, typically is overlooked. Cleaning your gutters, a large part of a roof compromise is granular loss. I mean, how many of you, if 
notice if you really change color since the storm, it actually got a little bit darker, right? You can see the blackness through the shingle because the granules on top of that root shingle got scrubbed off and washed into kind blood. Of granules all over around my house when I got that. Do you have gutters? I bet your gutters are full. Okay. Did your adjuster include clean your gutters? I haven't called them yet, that's why I'm here. Talk to them. <laughs> Say, hey, I expect those gutters to be clean because I put a granule right there. What if your gutters are connected to subsurface drainage? What's also full? The subsurface drainage is full of granules. Do you need to get that cleaned out? Absolutely, you do, because that's going to impede future water drainage. It's going to slow down quite a bit. Another concept I want you to think about is that uh, I was at a home today <coughs> in a garden, so his adjuster had already come. He started to see his first check. I said, did he include the plaster in your estimate? He says, no, she rock is it. No, sir. Go back and read your policy. Your policy says they have to replace it as it is. Uh, and they need to give you back to where you were. Well, he had the old-fashioned plaster, which was way more expensive than the salt and cheap rock. So go back and supplement your plan. Read your policy first, go back to the plan. Which, by the way, I am not an insurance agent. I am not an attorney. This is my legal advice. This is just, hey, Paul, your friend, I'm trying to help. Right? I probably should have said it at the very beginning of Facebook. All right, so. By the way, this is being recorded on here. It'll be put on our YouTube um, so that you can go back maybe to go back and watch it again because maybe you're saying hey I can't take fast enough notes or this is a lot or I know someone who needs to see this keep that in mind remember you build the case and, and, and that's that's the information you're providing you're being an advocate for your property but you may also be an ally to your insurance company now that's a strange relationship because sometimes you, you're, you're thinking that you're an opposite but you're really not at this part of the game, you're feeding them, providing information so that you can get an accurate adjustment, an accurate check to repair your home and put you back in a full position as you were before the event. Remember, no funny business. It's, 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 it's honesty. If it's got physical damage and you can prove it's physical damage from the storm, you want that included with your estimate. Some of the things I have seen, um, in fact, my, my, my primary residence, I had to adjust the short this past Thursday. First time they've seen the house, and my my windows are double insulated uh, vinyl frame windows, and on the east side, where the majority of the wind came, uh, they have condensation. I lost the seal of the insulated glass, and the house is it's on the decoration page. The house is 19 years old, so the just knows how old my house is. I said, hey, you know, here he's actually the one that has been damaged. So well, look, the windows they weren't sacrificed before. This this person, by the way, is out of town. Doesn't know my credentials. And I am not telling my professors. Okay? I'm, I'm trying to. I'm asking them questions of, because I'm trying to find information on how to prepare and provide information for them. So he says, "Well, your house is 19 years old, and you know, around 10 years, those windows seals lose their seal, and you get condensation in there." And he says, "You know, a lot of times that doesn't show up until you have a big event like this." I said, "Yeah, it's true." I said, "Because they were clear before, but now they're kind of condensated and frosted." You know, what do you think about that? He says, "Oh, we can't include it." physical damage as a result of this event. So what are the one things I could provide? I'm going to go hire a local professional who's going to look at the windows and have them assess them. And if that professional feels that that is to be included as a physical damage from the storm, I'm going to supplement my claim. I already know that's one of the things I'm going to have to test because he's already told me that they're not going to pay for it because it's only 10 years old. Age has nothing to do with it. It's all about physical damage. All right, let me just check some notes real quick and then I'm going to open up for some, some questions. Um, receipts of items you've already spent. If you have spent money to go um, back and forth, you're evacuated, and you were two hours away, and you came in a couple times to check on your property, and you were checking, and you were cleaning your refrigerator, and your freezer, and you're making sure things were, and you know, no one's breaking your house, and safe, secure. You need to save the receipts for gasoline, and they'll reimburse you. taking some action to mitigate the damage for further water damage. You had a branch that you know, put a hole through your roof and you hired someone to come patch that roof, even a temporary patch, save that receipt and include that in your claim. Those are all things you can reimburse for.
Can you talk about the difference between wind and, and flood? Anybody flood? You flooded. Okay, so two separate policies. I'm sure you've already figured that out between a, a flood policy and your, your, your wind. The way this was separated in the past, and it, it's true, it holds true through state and federal court, is that if you had flood waters that were two feet deep, typically uh, the, the flood waters would cover from four feet down because it's not just two feet that get wet. There's some capillary action of sucking up water and insulation, the sheet rock in the doors. So typically from four foot down would be included on your flood policy and four feet up would be included on your wood policy. Particularly if you had wood damage and where your, your roof got blown off or you lost shingles or, or tree fell on it, whatever the case may be. The reason they separated that way is because with Katrina there was a lot of um, cases where uh, the wood came first. Did the wind come first and the tree fall on the house first or did the floodwaters come first? And that's how they ended up in the federal judges said absolutely not. We're going to split it up where if you can prove that your water line is here, we're going to go up a couple feet above that for capillary action. That point down is on the flood policy and you know up above is, is going to be the wind policy. There were some houses that get their, their, their particularly the Katrina, uh, where the entire policy of the flood was paid without even being inspected because they knew where the house was, they knew how deep the water was, and they said, all right, we're just going to give you the full policy amount on your flood. Now you just have to go fight the wind. So how deep was the water in your house? Two separate adjusters, one for flood and one for wind. Good. And, and then, um, are you coordinating between the two of them, between floods come from here down and winds come from there up? Well, flood is working with us, doing what they're supposed to do. Wind is not. Do you have contents coverage as well through flood? Yes. Excellent. So, so we got it all. But that's another thing is like they want to give out a little check at a little check at a time. Yes. And I don't have time for that because yes. they want us to put our money out of our pocket. How do you know how much money someone has in their pocket? You can't expect someone to take out the money and put it back, and then you want to cut checks little by little. Sure. It just doesn't work that way, especially at The other part of this could be real complicated for you is your contents, and that's, yeah. that's at a, a whole other level because they want you to document every single thing in your home. So one of the things I do in preparation for a storm is right before I evacuate, I will go around with a camera, and I'll take every bit of five or six pictures and inside and outside of the house. I'll open drawers, I'll take pictures, I'll open closets, I'll take pictures, I'll go to the attic and take all kinds of pictures and contents in the attic. Because your memory gets kind of faded when you're in a, 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 a situation like this because of stress, lack of sleep, you just don't remember some of the things. When you take the photographs, you go back and remember, oh yeah, I do remember that was in that corner, this was here, or I had this in storage for the content side of it more than anything else. Yeah. The big stuff we remember is the small things we don't remember. And so, you know, it's going to take you some time and some effort to run through all those contents. Um, one of the things I'm going to, uh, do you have a fireplace in your house? Okay, all right, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, but um, I know a lot of flood policies, you want the fireplace to, you know, it'll dry. And if you read the manufacturer's specifications, they will not allow you to burn wood or gas at fireplace. So there's some things that I can help you with that. Uh, the electrical outlets. That, that you, some of the wiring you can't just cut off a few inches and, and use the rest of the wiring. It doesn't work that way. Um, your flood waters for for uh, class three flood water, category three flood water, so uh, it, it's contaminated. So anything inside your house is going to be able to be dry. It also needs to be sanitized. You have to do some uh, mitigation for organic growth for molds and all that. So there, there's even your your concrete slab is. Your concrete slab absorbs more water than the wood does in a very short order of time. That needs to be mechanically dry. So all the dehumidification has got to be included in your flood policy. The, um, any ceramic tile flooring needs to be pulled up because you're going to need there. So I'll let them tell you a little dry little more about that. Well, the, first, the first one we got to put over. We didn't know, and it was so much stuff that was happening. And then I was away, and then my mom and my sister were doing it. So they were just going to flow because the PA was like telling them how to do it. Well, we went to mitigation.
situation. We didn't get our money for nothing until five years later. And of course, the lawyer took a big chunk of that. Yes. And then you stopped because you wanted a little bit better. And then Isaac happened, and that happened again. But um, you know, after a period of time, you're going to really get your ducks in a row. So, yes. but it's still they they don't want to pay out. And you just got to go through that process of waiting. Hey. So, Paul, can it, you? It is a process. It really is. Can you speak to a few things? First of all, she said she had an adjuster who's not, the wind adjuster is not really working with you. The, the flood one is, the wind one. Um, what if someone has an adjuster? I mean, I, you I, I, I was about to say, I had one walk up and they're like, I know who you are. And I was like, oh God, this might not be good. <laughs> like, I'm like, you, you never know, right? Like, or what if the situation, um, they're just not complying or you feel like this person is, sure. They know no, they, they they have no concerns about you're like, oh man, this is just whatever. That's what I felt like with him. Like the way he was bantering my sister and my mom, it was like, look, we stayed at the property. I have videos of everything. I have videos of the roof blowing off, the, the water coming in, like mm -hmm. the windows blowing. I have videos of everything. Right. And then I didn't want to tell him I had the video because I wanted him to do his job first before I need to do my part. That's what you got licensed for. But it was just like he wouldn't, he wouldn't want to do it. So, Paul. How does she go about request? Like, what would that process look like? The same means you follow your claim for proof of loss. You can, whether it's online or a phone call, you need to call the same number or go on the same website and portal and request another adjuster. Same claim number, another adjuster. And, and you just tell them, hey, this, this person's not working well. You don't have to give any other reasons other than that. Um, the, the, the second thing is, is, um, can you speak to timelines? I know that these ladies here are trying to decide. Some people are still trying to decide, is it worth it? What is the responsibility of the property owner and what does that timeline look like to do this whole process? Is there a point where it's too late? So if you read your policy, it, it tells you you have, some of them say 30 days, some of them say 60 days after you discover there's damage for you to report the damage. But in a hurricane event such as this, that timeline normally gets extended. You may not discover you have damage until three months from now. And, and at that point, then you would provide your proof of loss, call in a claim, and say, I have damage to solve the hurricane item. I've already had someone come look at it, and you know, I need to report it and make a claim. That, that's not uncommon. You can certainly do that. Now, one thing I think I would do is if I am on the fence about making a claim, I'm going to read my declaration page and my insurance policy very carefully. I understand, understand all the dynamics, what's included, what's not included, what's my deductible amount. Uh, I may even give someone a professional come to my house and get an idea of what the cost is going to be to address it before I make that claim if you want the fence. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I did not make a claim after Katrina for my primary residence, and we had damage, but I made all repairs myself. Um, called a couple favors, we did a few things. Uh, it would have been right along my deductible amount. I didn't want to make a claim because I said, you know, keep in mind, this is years ago. I'm thinking, I don't want the insurance company to jack up my premiums too much. So I can do all this and I'll put it myself, not a problem. Insurance policy, your, your insurance premiums are going up no matter what. The entire region is going up because they're going to uh, rate it. If you notice, we had a very active hurricane season last year. What happened you renewed your insurance this past year? It went up. It's going to go up again because of Hurricane Ivan. So whether you make a claim or not, you can pay a, a decrease in your insurance premiums. If you have a claim, and uh, I, I think I would, use, I would make a claim. I would not hold off. And they're not allowed to hold act of God, an act of God against you. That's correct. And, and that's a good point. Is, uh, not anymore. No, right. It's an... <laughs> Is that since Katrina, right? Since Katrina. Yes, I was about to say, um, because that was everyone's fear in logic was, yeah, like, right. hey, during Katrina, like that was that was a pr um, prevalent mindset was, yes. if I do this, my insurance is going to go up, like it's going to be my record, I'm going to be docked, I'm going to be, you know, but and then that's when they included it in um, in policies, like they 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 built that in that act of God is different, right? You can't control that. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
cut it, you should be just as quick to cut it. And that's hey, what um, I said. Paul, you got about um, 25 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, you have to expect that's what's going to so Paul, can you speak about, because Paul and I have some projects together. A lot of you guys know that. Um, what if someone hasn't even had an adjuster out yet? All right, so I have a problem. I haven't adjusted out yet. And so I called my agent, who um, I network with and, and do a lot of business with. And she says, and this was a couple weeks ago. And, um, because I have one commercial policy with individual, all the individual properties fall on that larger commercial policy. So what actually happened was uh, there was a, a mix up where it, it should have been one claim number, same claim number for multiple properties. In reality, they signed master claim number and individual claim numbers thereafter. They got confused, they fell through the cracks. They said, come back, make another claim with an accurate number, claim number, and we'll start that process over again. What they did two weeks ago. So I, I reached out to her today and I said, hey, I still haven't gotten a phone call, still don't have uh, an adjuster scheduled for this property. It had a big, huge trade through it. You know, it's, 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 it's dry down, but I, I, want, I had moved my tenants out of it. Um, I need to get this process started. It's like, I got lots of photographs, it's all documented, I already got estimates and everything. I said, I want to see them come and just use it. So she sent an email to, um, and she included me, and I saw it this afternoon, where make another request saying, hey, this one must have slipped through the cracks, here's the claim number, here's the address, here is the insurance you know, name and cell number. Please act pretty quickly and get this one scheduled. Things like that are going to happen. That's just part of it. Can I go back to the roof situation? Sure. Um, my roof may be 16 years old, and somebody, I, I called them a while back before this hurricane and said that I was told by a roofer who jumped on my roof that I have hail damage. And they said, well, your roof is getting old. We can't do anything for you in that sense. It's a 30 year roof. And now that Ida has come along, brand was all over the place and other people say that their shingles were flapping in the wind with a 150 mile an hour event where it flapped in the parish. Um, can I really make them do something about it? Yes ma'am you can. Okay. Absolutely. So I would call a, a, a roofer and have them document the condition of your roof and uh, there, there's every insurance company describes a compromised roof a little bit differently and that's one of the questions I asked the, the adjusters when they come to step on a property, how does your company doc, you know, determine if this roof is compromised or not? Everyone has a little bit different story on that. Um, however, granular loss, although one that's a hard way to prove that your roof is compromised with granular loss, particularly a roof that's that old, because yeah. uh, it happens. But if, if, the, if it's lost its seal tab, if the individual shingles were blown up, that is a compromise. So if there are any creases, so when the shingle rolled up, if there's a crease in it, that's a sign of a typical compromise. Um, on my roofs, I actually, and I, and I walked the roof with, with Courtney uh, right after the event, I said, look, Courtney, let's, let's peel up the shingle, because it lost its seal. And look, there's debris underneath there, because when the wind was blowing, there was debris that blew underneath there. Some of you guys so saw, yeah. That. Some of you guys saw the video that I posted on social media. We're on the roof with some chalk, and we're literally circling all over the roof, all the places you know, that we were able to find um, where there's leaves, there's twigs, there's whatever underneath those shingles, um, because the, that's not supposed to be like that. Um, or there's places where you can see where the shingle, um, the wind blew up underneath it and it blew out of the, basically where the nail was holding it down. Yes. You can see stuff like that, right? Particularly as far as South Shore and Blackness. So I, I would definitely have someone look at your roof, spend okay. some time up, even if you need to pay them, a service call of 300 bucks. I, I would do that. Someone, I'm sorry. Okay. Someone else had said, he's a contractor. He said, I have this machine that can come prove that you had hail damage, some kind of infrared or whatever. Is that worth it? Well, it, it, since it's so far past the event of the hail event, yeah. previous to Ida, it would be difficult to prove it now. There are ways you, you, you can, when you, there, there's different ways you can assess a roof for impact damage. So your roof shingle has, has a couple different ratings. The two most important ratings is impact and wind resistance, which later on, when we talk about rebuilding, I'll talk about what you should be selecting when you're replacing your roof. But when you have hail impact, 
uh, and, and listen, they came to my subdivision a year and a half ago. All the neighbors can all brand new roots, right? And I can't think how many times people knocked on my front door. I finally put a little note on my door. I do not need a new roof. I've already walked it. I don't have hail damage. And I told them to name my insurance company. As soon as they hear who, I, who owns my insurance, which I'm not going to say a lot, I'll tell y'all later when y'all fail me. <laughs> they walk away because they know they can't fight that particular country because that particular insurance company doesn't give new roofs when it comes to hail. Probably the same insurance company you have. It's one of the big three. So, um, speaking with roofs, that's probably most because this was primarily a wind event for most people obviously flood in certain areas um that's one of the things that if you're looking from the ground up it may not look like damage but that upwind um is one of those things that most people are missing yes. um because you just can't tell oftentimes from the ground um so some additional things about impact if it, if you can't use an infrared to determine for example, my truck in the parking lot, it's not going to be able to. Okay. But you can look for uh, dings or semicircles or crush marks in the shingle. Mm -hmm. You have soft metals all over your house. Uh, the plumbing yeah, jacks, kind of like the vents, they have dips, little uh, dipples uh, in it. Mm -hmm. That's another indication of hail damage. The top of your air conditioning system is, is, is a metal shroud right? If that's a, little, that's a hard metal, it's not a soft metal. If that has dings in it, or your, 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 well, if you have over the power, uh, the overhead service line, that has been done. Those are all things that typically when I climb a roof, I'm looking for if it has hail damage or not. Okay. If you had that way back when, yeah, I, I don't care if it wasn't a big hurt or not, you had hail damage and you should have gotten a new roof. Yeah, I've got pictures of the little dings in the floor or wherever. Sure. That's an automatic thing? Like if you have hail damage, get a new roof? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, if yeah, you... Look, the each insurance company's own criteria. There's some insurance companies that will say, um, you need to have at least hail damage on every one of the slopes, each pitch of the roof, where you get a whole new roof. They may just replace certain slopes. Okay. Uh, but with an event as big as hurricane, I don't, you really should not be getting individual slopes replaced. You should be getting the entire roof replaced in general. So, Paul, with the, um, so we've got about 20 minutes. Um, can you speak? Um, First of all, do you, I don't know what you want to go to next here, but can you real quick speak to um, everyone's calling this similar to post-Katrina? And in some areas, it was as bad as Katrina was for some areas. Some areas, it's not, but we're 16 years removed from that. Are there things that you're seeing with the insurance process, the rebuilding process, that were similar in a good way or in a bad way to Katrina, and then things that you're seeing that were not the same. Can you kind of speak to that comparison? Because everyone has been saying the K word, and I think that's building some walls for people to get over, but it's also, you know, can you kind of speak to that? Well, let me say um, this event's gonna be different than Katrina. It's gonna take us a lot longer for us to recover than Katrina, even though we had fewer homes damaged. Because Katrina was really, particularly New Orleans area, was more of a flood event. Although we had a lot of wind damage, you can hear the motion on about this kind of thing. However, the reason it's going to take longer for us to recover now is because we have a less ability of materials. It's, it's really hard to come by. Uh, and that's getting ready to get worse, by the way. I've been talking to a couple of manufacturers, particularly air conditioning manufacturers, equipment. If you have an air conditioning to be replaced, I would prepay for someone to go and put it in your house now, as opposed to waiting that. In fact, we'll be waiting for months. Same thing for roof materials. It, it's going to be hard to come by roof materials. There are places in Lake Charles right now that still don't have roofs replaced because they're still waiting for shingles a year later. This storm has put a big impact on availability materials as well as labor. So be extremely patient. It's going to be difficult for you to get multiple bids. Uh, I've heard a couple of justices say, well, get three bids and couldn't send us out three bids and you know, we'll choose the best one. Listen, you get three different companies to show up your house on you can do the estimates the same scope of work. I need to hire you as a procurement agent because I can't do it. And I've been doing this for 30 years. But that's going to be virtually impossible. So be patient, be kind. Uh, man, you can get a lot more work done with honey than you can't prevent it. So uh, I, I think those are some of the guiding principles you have. Ask questions. Man, I, I, I want to help. So if, if I'm not answering your question here tonight. Send me an email. If you come up with a scenario that you don't know how to face, send me an email. I, I, I want to help. Uh, 
this is something that uh, we can learn from my experiences and do keep in mind something is very simple with Katrina. You get a lot of new adjusters then too as you do now. That is not uncommon these big disasters. And these folks just are not construction experts. They don't have the knowledge that they should have in order to truly assess your house. That's why I'm asking you to rely on your local professionals uh, that, are, that are licensed and sure, your roofers, your electricians, your plumbers, your HVAC dealers. Have them come and assess your house. If you think you've got structural problems, hire your own structural engineer. Is that money out of your pocket? Absolutely. And I know that's tough, but that's what your emergency fund's for. This isn't a rainy day, what is? Just, yes, just it, it's pouring right now. You're going to be putting some money out of pocket up front, but this is money well spent because you can give it back to the insurance company. If, presuming you had damage and it's connected to the event. Yes, sir. You just said something you went by very, very quickly. Licensed, insured. Yes, sir. I want you to let anybody fly with my room that doesn't have insurance. Mm -hmm. I want you to name your mom the additional yes, insurance. So, insured, and then Paul, can you talk about how you can check and see if someone's licensed? Um, yes, so Louisiana is very, this is actually something that's a great improvement since Katrina. It's going to the contractor's license board, and you can go online and find out if that person's licensed or not. Can you speak to the contractor license, the handyman license, the difference between the two? So, there's a number of different licenses that the contractor's board. Um, there are folks that are uh, commercial general contractors. There are residential general contractors, and there's the home improvement contractors. The home improvement contractors uh, can only work on properties up to a certain amount. It's either 25 or 50,000. One time it was 25, now I think it's 50. There's an app that you can search contractor name, license, qualifying party. Yes. And then you can so let me kind of put my local spin on this. Yes, too. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I am so afraid because my roof is not leaking, but I do see some areas where shingles, and I went and looked at all my inside because it's all, you know, boy, you've been in my house. I brought my report. You've been in my house. And I don't see any, any you know, water intrusion in any of this, and I see all these nails. And so I'm thinking I'm going to spend a fortune for a new roof. I have a, all the dust. It's all going to come out of my pocket. And I might get a worse roof than I already have. So I'm in this really horrible gray area, and that's why I said, i got to come talk to Paul and say, look, you see, you've been to my house. You've seen all this. <laughs> so let me say that um, I would call the insurance commissioner with your policy out in front of you and read them that language and get their ruling on that, okay. get their opinion. Okay. Uh, I do know that uh, I heard Donald say the same thing. Uh, and also, as a reminder, because you brought something that will do things after hurricane season. In the state of Louisiana, you have one hurricane deductible that carries the entire season. Yeah, that's so why I'm So we hurricane next week, and I think the second deductible. Yeah. Yeah, that's why Hold oh, on, hey, Rita, that wood back there? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we have cold fronts coming in. I, I, I'm hoping. We're I know, but we've had one last year. We had one in December. Well, let me, let me say, there's, have you guys heard of the surplus lines policy? Yes. The surplus lines are, are companies that are not registered with the state of Louisiana. They're usually cheaper than the ones that are registered with the state of Louisiana. Donovan doesn't have any say for them. It's just your agreement. With them. So that's like Lloyd's of, Lloyd's of London is a big surplus bond. So you have to look at your, your policy. And it says at the top, and you also now, I know I've seen where they actually say, you, you sign something with your wife saying this is a surplus life line policy and it's not registered with the state of Louisiana. Yeah. So, so, good or bad. so you have to you have to look, it says that at the very top of your, uh, your policy. It'll say this is a surplus line policy. And then the other issue with that is the insurance company goes bankrupt. The state of Louisiana doesn't doesn't back it. That's why policies are more expensive for Louisiana policies that with the register of Louisiana because there's a fund and I don't know how much you said fund, but there's a fund with with the the state with the Department of Insurance that will come in and help cover claims for companies that actually go under. So they really the companies that are registered with the state are probably the more financially. Not, that's not to say that the surplus line companies aren't financially secure. It's just that they may be able to- Say that last part again. Surplus, there's, I'm not saying that surplus line companies are not financially secure, but they may be able to put stuff in their policies that, because they, they don't have to comply well, with- Well, I've had company. the same policy for over 51 years because I've always been afraid, and I've never used my policy. But um, and it's so high already, just because of being in the areas, that that I'm so afraid. And I've tried to move my policy, but they, the, every time I try to move to somebody else, the new insurance says, "Listen, uh, you can change, but if you have to use this policy, we can drop you." So I didn't want to be dropped because that's what they said. The only benefit of having the same policy. I don't know if this is true or not. This is what they keep holding over my head when I'm even going to move my policy. Hey, Paul. Yeah, every and I've been to I've been at to at least probably since Katrina to about six or seven different insurance companies because I said because I said I just as well be just self insured because it's so everything I pay is my premiums e extravagant my, I told I have an eighty thousand dollar deductible on my house mm -hmm. and so I'm going why am I even carrying insurance but every time I go to move they say. We could, if you have to make a claim, then we can drop you. Where I don't think they can drop. I've been with the same one for 51 years now. I don't know if that's all true. I don't know who you ask these questions to. That's why I'm here Donald's to office. see you. Donald's Donald's office Donald. can help you with that. Yeah. Okay. They sure can. They should not be able to drop you as a, as a result of, of a hurricane such as this. Back to God. Now, if you make multiple claims not related to this, I've never made any, one any claim. Insurance company because drop. every claim I ever made when we. 50 years ago, actually was a tree that fell on my neighbor's house and they called it an act of God and we wanted to pay for the neighbor's damage because they said it was an act of God. <laughs> so, I never, they've never paid any, they've never paid anything for me because I've always, my deductible size, so I always pay it. And so, and now with this roof, I'm, I'm so worried because of so many nails down and I do want to get that H grade, what you talk about every Saturday. 
I want to get that, but I'm so afraid that there's already so many nails in my roof that they're going to wind up having to take all the wood, everything down. Unless I'm just going to have a sieve up there, you know? <laughs> you probably did a couple pictures and some of the I have some pictures. I took them before I came today. <laughs> um, so, Paul, you got about 10 minutes left. And Can I talk about one more thing and then we open for questions? Then? Yep, however you want to land the plane. So we had to talk about loss of use. If, if you're an investor and you had to move your tenants out like I did, does your policy include loss of use? You go back and read your policy. Now, this is not for your, your primary residence. Your primary residence probably has some loss of use, but that's very short. Presuming you can, your house is livable, that's going to be very short term. Well, they have ALE, right? Yeah, yeah. living expenses. Just a different name. Certainly should help you with if you had to evacuate. Uh, but a lot of that is, is, is capped to if there's a max of that. I'm really talking about if you have an investment property and you, you're tend to head and move out because that house is no longer habitable. If there is a, you go back and read your policy, but you should have some form of a loss of use. One thing I want to talk to you about specifically, and I mentioned it earlier, is that because it takes so much longer to get these houses back to uh, where they're repaired, we can get them back on the market. You need to be ready for having those discussions with the insurance company. Most times, they you okay with six months, you know, you'll be able to get your house repaired in six months and you'll be dead in there. I don't think it's gonna happen in this event. I'm prepared for a year. Um, in fact, my, when my tenants were moving out, they said, well, you know, call us back a few months and, you know, they've been with me for 17 years. And, and you know, we'll, we'll move, I'm sorry, 16 years. We'll move back in the house. We love the house, love the neighborhood, love you guys. I said, maybe we'll do a few months. I said, just, you can be out of this house for a year. I said, you need to go find a, another location to live in. And once the house is finished, you want to come back, we'll talk then. But it, it, these, the timelines can be extended. So it's fun. Being prepared when you're getting estimates from your general contractors and your subcontractors, how long is it going to take to make this improvement? So that, and run it down on, on a proposal, so that you can give this information to your insurance company so that you can get that those additional time frame for the loss of use. I like using local contractors, particularly there's a lot of folks that can't find a town for the roofs. And we need those folks by the town. And they're the vast majority of them do a really great job. I still prefer using a local roof because it's a good chance that something's going to happen that there is, you know, they'll be here to help you fix that problem. Also, I think when you use the local, I've never had a problem at having to, I never had to ask for to, to see the, their insured because they're happy to show you all their credentials. Yes. They have a package and they say, Here's my insurance, here's my this, this, and that. I mean, so local people that if you use them, they continue to show you that you don't have to more like you're talking about. So if someone's from out of state, I, I'm immediately taking a picture of them, their truck, their license plate. I'm making them put everything in the proposal in great written form, uh, in great detail. Uh, I'm, I'm having their insurance agent email me a copy of their insurance certificate. I'm not letting them give me a copy of insurance certificate. There's a lot of extra things I do who I don't already have a relationship with. And I'm like, if I know they're in town, if I have a relationship with them already, there's some things I may or may not do, just because I have a relationship with them. And we've done business in the house. Um, Paul, can you talk about two things? Um, can you talk about Paul's house um, as a resource between referrals, but also the blogs? Um, and then secondly, can you talk about the radio show as far as because um, I know you're a very busy man and you're going to offer your email address like you do all the time, but the, the radio show is a free place every week that people can ask you questions through text and phone. Yeah, so the radio show starts, it's every Saturday from 11 to 1, and, and this was a show we put in place actually right before Katrina. I remember, I was trying to remember that earlier, it was before Katrina, it was right around Katrina. Uh, and um, this is a, a live call and radio show talking about things like this. So I encourage you to call and text into that. It's, it's every Saturday until we can preempt it. Uh, LSU football. Um, WWL 870. WWL 870 FM. Uh, in, in addition to that, let me give you some other resources. I really want you to dig this because you had flood. Uh, there is some flood party designs that we, uh, I teach at LSU building sites like this uh, and, and rehab and refurbishing. And there are some flood party techniques we put together for houses uh, that are flooded so that when they flood again, you don't have to take them completely apart. There are some steps you can do, there are some mid-steps you can do to protect the building. Uh, 
Uh, so go to uh, Louisiana House on LSU Ag Center's website, and when you get to the search area, search Water Party Walls, and you'll see some of the improvements we made. We did a lot of blog postings also on Paul's House. It's paulshouse.com. Uh, that's our website where uh, it's a free to consumers. It's any it's folks that I've known for, for years that are in the business, whether they're professionals offering services or they're, they're companies that are offering materials for improvements or new construction homes. Uh, and I named it Paul's House because these are people I would have come to my home to do work in my house. And so great, lots of recommendations there. A lot of blog posts in there. So if you're looking for, you know, what about this and what about that, search the blog section. There's some good information there as well. And, and that's, that's always available. So he undersells Paul's house. Probably the number one thing people ask for is, hey, who are you using for this? Who are you using for that? Paul's house is something I actually give out a ton. Uh, so they have, you know, the South Shore, North Shore, Baton Rouge, you know, all of that. You're looking for roofers. You're looking for, you know, X, Y, Z. So you want to go, um, so that's excellent for that. But those, after 16 and 17, those floods, you pumped a ton of resources into those blogs on Paul ha Paul's house. Um, so read it like that would be huge for you with you guys in um, Laplace. There's, he spent a ton of time pitting stuff from 16 and 17. That is, you know, talking about, hey, how to rebuild after the flood and, and um, maybe if you're in a flood prone area or hey, if you wanna be flood hardy against, those are huge. I know um, Paul and I have looked at projects that are in a flood prone area and we were looking at doing major renovations and then we we're like, well, look, if we're already going to, and this was outside hurricane season, all right, hey, we're looking at this commercial project, but it's in a flood prone area. Hey, it's going to have a major renovation. Why don't we already include in the renovation some of this stuff, right? This is not hurricane related. It's, hey, if we're going to go ahead and do a major renovation on a project, what if we do this, right? Paulshouse.com? Yes. Yeah, no. So, um, so that's a huge resource, Paul. Some other thoughts? Um, as you. I know you mentioned one a couple years ago. Used. I want to ask you about that. No, absolutely. You know, it's an issue with everything. The tarp, you know, people are tarping it, and then the adjusters come out and they take it off or have to sets on it. Can you. Uh, sure, I can take it to my adjuster. You take it off, you put it back on. I can show you pictures of everything that looked like before, but that's off. You should got here sooner. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, listen, I, 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 have, I, I have a hard time about that one. I really do. And I don't want to be a spot out, but goodness sakes. If you take my top off and I get wet and get more damage, who's responsible for that? You and me. If you take my top off, you're responsible for it back on. And I will tell that when I, when, because they'll ask you when, you when you make the claim, is it already taught? And I'll tell them. Yes, sir, it is. And you better have your adjuster prepared to, he's going to remove it, they need to put it back on it. Because I won't be doing it a second time. Unless you pay me for it. Um, so I have a project that I'm fighting insurance on. I got a, re, uh, a roof two weeks before, um, before Ida hit on a very high pitched two story project, a uh, higher end home. Um, the adjuster took pictures of before he placed his ladder, after he placed his ladder, because he's like expecting it to go to court. And he wants to say, I want to prove that I didn't do like extra damage, but the, but it goes to the point. Now he's, he was a more experienced adjuster. Um, it goes to the point though, that there are adjusters who could be making damage to roofs for just going up there walking. We're going up, like if, like if, if just a civilian's going up there to put a tarp on there, you don't know, you know, is there further damage happening, things like that. So again, Paul's making a great point. Um, who's going to be liable for that? Taking pictures. I document everything. I can't tell you how many thousands of pictures I have on my phone since the storm. Uh, it, it's take lots and lots of pictures. Document, document, document. You can't take too many photographs at every stage. Is there a way to 
is there a particular root product that you like, and is the, the supply line backed up even in the Midwest or the North or something like that? It is. So I don't really talk about brand names as much as I talk about classifications and, and, and criteria for performance. So performance criteria is essential at the end of the day. Sorry. Keep the words out. So here's what I'm going to do for my personal home for my roof. <coughs> I'm going to take all my roof shingles off. I'm going to take all my roof under limit off. I'm going to completely expose the roof deck. There are some companies out there that are saying, hey, you don't need to remove the felt bed, but you just remove the shingles and go right on top of it. I don't like that idea. The reason I like that idea is because you don't have full disclosure. So you may have some roof decking that uh, could be compromised from the storm. Well, you're not going to know it unless you remove everything and see the entire roof decking. So I'm going to remove all my nails. I'm going to inspect my entire roof. Um, I'm actually going to take it a step further. You're going to understand that I, I only see the ugly stuff. People only hire me when the house is all behaving. No one hires me to come see, look, my house is perfect. Come, please, my house is out. behaving. Come watch it. Right. I want to see the bad kids that don't behave, right? So I'm, I'm a little anal about this. You've got to take some of this with a grain of salt. So I'm removing all my roof, all my roof underlayment. I'm just closing my entire roof deck. I'm going to expect every square inch of it. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to re-nail my roof that wasn't available 20 years ago when I built my home with a nail called a paraquake nail. Paraquake? Paraquake. Can you spell that? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was designed by the engineer on Dade County, and it's, it's, it's designed specifically to improve your roof from being removed off the rafters because it would not lift in a hurricane or a tornado. It's like a hurricane or a hurricane. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to renail my roof decking to my rafters just because I can at this point. Once so that's new. I'm going to have my roof off, yeah. right? I'm never, hopefully, going to have my roof off anytime soon. I'll replace my underlayment. And I'm going to use a synthetic underlayment. And that's going to be the main part of my house. The parts that are critical areas around the valleys, around the special flashes, uh, roof to wall connections, I'm going to use that peel and stick membrane at the critical areas. Some people call it uh, ice and water shield. What is it called? Ice and water shield. Ice and water shield. Yes, it's just a peel and stick membrane. Depending on your roof deck and, you, and, and the manufacturer of that peel and stick membrane, you may have to do part of your roof deck first so that peel and stick actually adheres to your roof deck. So keep that in mind. So my next step is I am replacing drip edge all the way around. The reason for replacing drip edge is currently my fascia is, has an integral drip edge built into it. I'm going to put another drip edge on top of it. The reason for it is because the new roof systems that are out today, which I'm going to tell you about in a few seconds, require a drip edge to adhere that lower coarse edge shingle to the edge of drip edge. The spot that's the weakest link for your roof is the bottom course and also the ridge caps. So when you have a new drip edge, you can use a what's called a starter shingle bed, which is one of the items, especially the items I have in here for the roof house, which I'll share that with you all if you want to take a picture of it. A starter shingle has adhesive on the bottom of the shingle and on the top of the shingle, at the very edge of it, the outer lower edge. So the lower adhesive adheres to the new drip edge that I'm installed. The upper adhesive adheres to the first course of shingles. And I'm going to work my way all the way up. I'm using a class H roof shingle and a class 4. The class H is the wind resistance. The class 4 is the impact resistance. Just because you get an impact resistant shingle doesn't make it wind resistant. Don't fall for that salesman shingle. So I'm selling you a class four impact resistant shingle. That's fantastic. It's a great rating. That's the rating I'm going to use, the class four. But it doesn't qualify for a wind rating. The wind rating is the, it's going to be the class H. So the class H is a three second gust of 150 mile an hour wind for three seconds. And it's a roof as a system. So we're starting with the, with the drip edge. We're starting in the continue with the starter shingle. We use the class eight shingle. We also need to match that roof shingle with the ridge and hip caps. And if you're using a ridge vent for your ventilation in the upper part of the attic, make sure you get a ridge vent that matches that roof system. 
-hmm. And I'm also going to hand nail it. I'm not going to use a pneumatic nailer. Because when you use a pneumatic nailer, a lot of the fasteners are overdriven or driven at an angle, and it creases and cracks that shingle. So that's the last thing you want to do is, is, is have a crease in it. Because when you do the window net, it's, it's more susceptible to pulling up. How much um, pushback do you get from the asking them to nail it versus to do the pneumatic, right? Because the pneumatic thing, do, 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 do. You need to find the right roofer, and, and they'll be willing to hand nail it. They can charge you for it. What's the part of your house that's most susceptible to rainwater drainage? The roof. To me, that's worth spending some money on. I'm going to pay more money to get this hand nailed. Um, and I'm okay with that. You're speaking a very high level roof. You're, you're, you're pitting the best roof on the top of your house, right? Would you pit the same roof on your rental properties? Because yeah. that's your primary, right? And so. Um, talked about that because it's going to be more expensive, right? It's not the cheapest option. And then um, as we start to land the plane here, because I know we're over time here, but um, because a lot of people are saying, hey, it's my rental property. Let me just, you know, go cheap. But but can you just real quick talk to that? Let me give you another, another tip in reference to that. I'm going to circle back to what you're saying, Courtney, because I think it's a great point. Um, you're most of your insurance policies have a ordinance in it for codes, building codes and law ordinances. And in St. Henry Parish, and it's more so in Clackens, where you are further south, is there's new wind ratings that were uh, adopted by the state since Hurricane Katrina. So uh, if you've got a roof at Katrina right before Katrina, uh, like yours is 16 years old, right? So you got it right at the right before Katrina that roof probably does not comply with today's wind ratings. So your insurance adjuster is going to look at it and say, well, you got a three-tab shingle, and that three-tab shingle is rated for 110, 115 miles an hour. But if you look at the codes, where you are, you do have a class H 150 mile an hour shingle. That's code, you gotta have it. So your policy is gonna say, hopefully you go back and you can read it, they'll have an ordinance that says that if you have some extra money available for you for upgrading your house, apply with the new laws, such as wind ratings. Now, can you apply that same thing to your investment properties? I know. I know here in St. Henry Parish, uh, we have a new wind code that wasn't here in North Katrina. It didn't get adopted until 2007 or 8. And it's been improved and increased since that time, since its original adoption. So uh, I've already had an adjuster look at a rental property here and then it was a duplex. And he says, you have a three-tap shingle, uh, you know, we're going to give you a replacement for a three-tap shingle. I said, yes, sir, that's fine. But I said, well, you need to know about this ordinance. I already was prepared for it. I had a copy of the ordinance, and I showed the wind map. I was the building code book. So look, in the building code book, this wind map. You have my policy. What are you going to do? He says, well, I'm going to record the three-tap. He says, but I want you to scan that and send it to my desk adjuster. Because remember, the guy in the field is just documenting today. What's there, right? He's not the decision maker. But be prepared for this information to feed it to the insurance company to give it to the desk adjuster so you can get that better roof to apply with the codes. Am I putting the same roof on my investment properties that I am on my primary? Yes, I am. My portfolio is for me, my kids, my grandkids. I'm going to do the best thing I possibly can. Plus tax benefits. Plus, there's a lot of tax benefits that my CPA is writing me with the care for. So, as we, as we land this here, um, y'all, Paul is a wealth of knowledge. Ev I don't recall how long I've been on the radio with you, but every Saturday, I still sit there and I'm like, first of all, I'm not doing enough maintenance on my house every day, <laughs> like, or I, I learn something new, right? Wealth of knowledge, I say this all the time. If you can listen on Saturday, listen. I know you might be driving in your car or go back. You can call or text in. Hurricane related or not. I know people are like, hey, I walked a house and the, the, the slabs cracked. You know, I had some questions about this and I can't get a song. Call in, ask a question about it. Or, hey, I'm doing a project right now and I've got termites and I'm trying to put, should I go back with regular insulation behind the stucco or should I put a uh, spray foam, right? Like ask, and I, I've got a project about that. Heck, I can feel the questions every Saturday just from all of my projects I have just to keep the two hours rolling, right? So keep that's that's a resource you can text in or you can call in um you can listen to some replays of that um but paul is a huge resource um paul has been working very hard 
Uh, I will say this, Paul does have a consulting company. Um, you can, I know you mentioned your report. You can hire him to actually do a report to go to your case for like, say if you are fighting your, you know, going, you know, trying to build your case. I don't want to say fighting your insurance. If you're building your case of information, um, Paul can, as a local professional can provide you with some of that. Uh, I know Paul's not going to lead with saying that, but I'll say that. Um, on, and that's something you may want to look at if you have a more difficult situation. Um, and then Paul, um, other than the radio show, because that is something where it is on your calendar to be there, people like, but that is built into his calendar. I want to say this, when you have um, experts who oftentimes are busy you want to go where they are building things and they're scheduled to help you. Um, otherwise, it your calendar, how long are it is for an appointment for a report right now? Second week of December. Second week of December to get, a, to get on his calendar right now. So that's why knowing this, I would say, hey, the weekends are a great time to get some of the questions like you have tonight. If they're not getting answered, um, this Saturday we're preempted. Go LSU. Go LSU. Oh. So we're not going to be on the show this weekend, but, but next weekend, uh, the following weekend, um, that's a great time. The reason why I'm saying that is because I know that his, his calendar gets pushed out, things along those lines. Paul, any final words as we go ahead and wrap up here? Let me encourage you. This is a slow burn. This is not hurry up. This is a marathon. Don't get distracted up front and keep acting very intentional. And just be your biggest athlete. Be that insurance company. An insurance company is not your enemy. Feed them the information. They are begging for information right now. Hire those professionals to provide it for you to give it to them. Can you speak about like the, um, in, in each insurance policy, there's an appraisal clause where you can yes, sir. kick in and like, what's the time frame on that? So typically appraisal clause, you're not going to start the appraisal process until a year from now. So why is that? Because most times it takes that long for you, the insurance company, to get left an option for an appraisal. So the appraisal process depends on the insurance company. Uh, some of appraisals, depending on your policy language, the appraisal uh, uh, language is somewhat vague. Some of it's very specific. The ones that are very specific say uh, you're going to do an appraisal, you're elect for an appraisal process uh, if you agree to scope of work but you disagree on the unit cost. There are some that are, that are vague that you can disagree on the scope of work and unit costs are okay. So I, I have served for, um, as an appraiser and also um, as an umpire to that process on, on I should say, a regular basis on occasion <coughs> over the years. To me, I would much rather see you negotiate through that, not go through the appraisal process. The appraisal process is very lengthy and very costly. You could spend more money for representation than you'll ever recover from that process. I can show you. Listen, if, if in the legal, can you turn that off? Hey, before we do that, and because I'm very close to doing that, can you um, can you give the office and your email for if people want to contact you, yes. and then I'll and then I'll turn it off, and then you can say the things yeah, you don't want to say. I'll answer your question. Um, so if you have questions, best thing is go to Paul's house Facebook site, post your questions there online. If you if you haven't already liked the page, just go to the Facebook. Uh, actually, the best way to go to navigate through it, go to the website, paulshouse.com. Top right-hand side is the Facebook icon. Click on it. It will automatically navigate you to the Facebook group page. It's like the Facebook page, and you can push your questions there. It's probably the best thing to do. If you want to call the office, you can do that. It's just that my bill will be extremely limited. I left the house this morning at 5. I have access. So, um, but the office number is 985-845-2148. 2148. Um, you can speak with Sherry. She's at the office. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and shut this off. This is the benefit of being here in person.